Two months ago, I'd never owned, let alone heard, an 8-track cartridge. But since buying this 1972 Toshiba 8-track player from eBay, I've been having a lot of fun with these things. But I wanted more fun. So in this video, I'm going to put the 8-track back into its spiritual home. Back to where it was meant to be. The car. I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and I know how much bad press this format has received over the years, and to some extent I agree with at least some of it. It's true that it's a flawed format, and it's easy to see why it eventually lost out to the compact cassette. But the freedom it gave music lovers back in the day was a revolution, and it's easy to see why it took off big time back in the late 60s and early 1970s. Today, just by being a physical format, it's ludicrous and the sound it provides is probably not even middle-end, let alone high-end or audiophile quality. I really like the physical feel of the tapes, and OK, they go wrong now and again, but I'm happy repairing a broken splice or replacing a foam pad, in the same way as I clean a record or repair an album cover. In fact, I quite like it. Anyway, after listening to a lot of tapes on this player through a proper system, not on these terrible AKG K150s, which were, incidentally, the type used in the EMI factory to test records with. How those girls must have suffered with those on their ears all day. I've been really impressed with the sound on some of them, especially compared to the compact cassettes of that late 60s, early 70s period. And there were a few reasons why that was. Basically, everything on the cartridge was, technically, twice as good. Firstly, the cartridges used a quarter-inch tape, which could carry more signal than that of the 1 8 inch tape of the cassette. Secondly, the tape ran at 3 and 3 quarter inches per second, twice as fast as that of the cassette. Thirdly, the 8 tracks were duplicated at a ratio of 16 to 1, whilst the cassettes were done at 32 to 1. The ones which really stood out as being the best sounding for me were these early EMI tapes, which was mainly down to the type of tape they used and that was a special lubricated tape, all of which had to be imported from the USA. This, however, was short-lived, as by the time the tape factory had moved along with a record pressing plant to the Uxbridge Road plant in 1972, EMI had developed their own tape formulation, but it was still superior to the tape the other companies were using at that time. As I've said before, I've been enjoying these tapes on this old Toshiba machine here, but I really wanted to hear them on a system they were originally designed for in the first place. The automobile. You know, cars. Now this is a Sanyo FT833M 8-track car stereo player. And as you can see on the sticker, it has a four-channel stereo matrix, which basically means you can plug four speakers into it. Now, Sanyo was a big deal back in the day. It was founded in 1947, but uh, really took off in 1970 when it was introduced to the United States by a brilliant man named Howard Ladd. And he turned Sanyo into a real multi-million dollar company and one of the most successful and popular consumer electronic brands of the 1970s and 1980s. But this is what I've got to deal with today. And we're gonna open it up and see if it works. Now, this isn't the original tape, which was on the machine from new. Uh, the seller had opened it to be photographed, etc., on eBay. But um, I'm gonna open it up for the first time here and see what we've got inside. This is the original packing, but uh, it's probably done its job pretty well. First thing we've got in the box is the original instructions. Uh, there it is, operating instructions. 
does your FT883M. It is a high performance eight track cartridge player, which incorporates a matrix circuit, which provides for playback of two channel stereo tapes in two channel stereo or in four channel stereo through the matrix circuit when four speakers are in use. Okay, well, I'm not going to use four speakers. Oh, that's the uh, warranty registration card. And there we go. That's how this gets wired up to four speakers, and there's a schematic and a way to floor mount it and under dash mounting. And other general instructions. That's quite helpful to have a schematic on this thing. Printed in Japan and made in Japan, like all good quality things were from this period. That's a good start. Okay, there it is. Move the box out of the way. And it's still in its original, seems to be original bag. Let's get it out. And there it is. It's still got its original uh, tag on it two, two channel stereo, four channel stereo matrix. And there's a little bit of information about Sanyo, one of the world's largest industrial complexes with over 17,000 employees and more than 300 acres of manufacturing facilities. Its diversified products cover some 100 categories, including radios, televisions, car stereo, home entertainment systems, audio components, and electronic calculators. Yeah, so they made some good stuff. So there it is. Uh, what have we got on the front here? We've got... Uh, uh, this is FF, maybe fast forward, low tone, high. Oh, that appears to be a an on off switch. Then we've got uh, left and right volumes, uh, a channel selector switch and a repeat button. There's the bracket on the top. It can either go underneath or on top as per the instructions. So I'm not sure how that's gonna go just yet. And what have we got on the side here? It says, uh, da, 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 da. Japan, that's just a serial number or a model number. And on the back, Sanyo car stereo player model FT883M, 12 volts negative ground. And that's the final inspection number. I've also got a switch on the back here, the four channel and two channel matrix. And helpfully, the original leads were combined into this plug, which I won't pull apart, but it's uh, secured in there and some connectors at the end. So that all looks Pretty good to start off with, nice and clean. Everything seems to be there. I like to see tags on things. Let's get it hooked up and see if it works. These are the speakers I've bought to test it with. These are Pioneer TS44, 10 centimeter, 40 watt speakers. They're not the best speakers in the world. They were, I think, 35 euros, but uh, this is not a real high-end machine. So I think they're more than adequate for the job. And of course we need something to connect it to, a power supply. So this uh, 12 volt battery is gonna be the power supply. So let's get it all hooked up. So according to the manual here, front speaker, I need a gray wire going to 
the ground and a green wire going to the positive. So let's find the green wire, which is that one. Put this alligator clip or crocodile clip on that. So green, that's to go to the positive of the speaker. And let's take a yellow one going to the gray wire here, going to the ground of the speaker. Okay, that's that. Now we need to get some power to the player itself. So we've got a positive here, which has already got a, a spade on it, which is good because that connects on my battery terminal very nicely. And of course we need a negative from the black wire, which is difficult to see, but it, there it is. Let's make sure these don't touch. There we go. All right, we're all connected up. Uh, yeah, let's just turn it down. Let's have a look. You can see inside. Can't actually see inside. There we go. That's it. So you can see inside there. There's a nice clean head. Um, it all seems to be there ready for the tape. So I've got one of these. Uh, this came with a collection I just bought. It's uh, a Radio Shack blank cassette and on it it's got recorded uh, the 27th of September 1980, the uh, Capital Countdown, the chart show from Capital Radio, London's independent local radio station. Some good music on here, but unfortunately I can't play the music <laughs> because of copyright, obviously. Um, but we're going to see if the tape runs. Let's Pop it in. Ah, there we go. Immediately something's happening. We've got uh, track three playing. So that doesn't seem to do anything. This, uh... ah, I see. That's fast forwarding now. Yeah, hear the change in speed when I flick that up. Okay, that's good. Um, channel, let's see if the channel selectors work. One, two, three, four. Good, they all work. Uh, let's see if we've got any sound. Yes, we have. <laughs> um, there is some speaking on this. Uh, There's some music coming out there. Not from that channel though, but I haven't got the other um, speaker connected, so that's understandable. Yeah, so that sounds pretty good. So I've got a working vintage player. All I need now is a vintage car to put it in. This'll do. Well, this is a 1968 Rover P5B saloon. And as you can see, she's a classy old girl. Finished in Bordeaux red, built in Solihull in England in September 1968. This, as I said, is the saloon version. There was a coupe version, a four-door coupe version. These cars were built between 1959 and 1973. This example has the Buick, or Buick derived, three and a half litre engine, which was introduced to this model in 1967. Uh, 
So this is quite an early car in the production and these cars would have been driven by your bank manager, company director, that sort of person and were in fact used by the British government from 1967 right up until 1980. These cars were also a favourite of Her Majesty the Queen. She owned two and still owns the last one ever produced. As you can see it's sometimes called the Gentleman's Club on Wheels and for good reason. These really deep real leather armchair seats and there's lots of room and luxury in the back. Also sometimes called the poor man's Rolls Royce but uh, I don't think that's entirely fair because these were incredibly well built cars until they were bought by British Leyland. But uh, this is one of the last sort of handmade cars before all the British car industry went wrong. A radio was available as an option with this model but this car didn't have one. This is where the radio would have been behind this glove box and it would have basically consisted of a, a unit hidden in there with uh, this part of the glove box which is now lovely African walnut wood uh, would have been a speaker grill and the radio would have sat in a little space down there. What I'm planning to do is to put the 8-track player in here on the parcel shelf and the speakers underneath either side because obviously I'm not going to cut holes in the door cards or anything stupid like that. Um, so hopefully we'll have enough room. I may have to take this, uh, this crash rail off uh, to get the speakers or player in but we'll just have to see how it goes. I didn't have to take the crash rail off after all. All I did was loosen some fittings and it gave it enough give to squeeze the speakers underneath there, which they are now, if you can just see those. The player sits nicely in this gap. Um, I have to maybe prop it up like that and fix something behind it so it doesn't push back when I push a tape in so somehow I've got to fix it uh, so it sits about there and of course I have to wire it in. I've tested it all on the bench and it does work but unfortunately there's been one casualty already in the shape of my uh, 62 to 66 cartridge which the player decided to eat. But hopefully that's the last of that sort of thing. Um, let's get it all wired up and see if it works. So success, after about three hours of fighting the car, I don't, don't mean fighting the car, but it's one of these cars which is so over-engineered, use three screws when one will do. Anyway, it's taken a while, but I've got there, it's all wired in, so I'll show you exactly how it looks. So everything's in place. Underneath here, we've got one of the speakers, and the right speaker is under there. And of course, here's the player in the middle. It's, uh, it's pretty well secured in there. I mean, there's a bunch of wires behind it which provides it with a bit of a backstop. Um, but let's see if it works. I wanna make sure it's turned down. Turn the ignition on, of course. And let's see. Yeah, it's definitely going. You can see the channel selectors going through. Let's see if we get a bit of music. <laughs> That's from two. Power Plus from Ever Ready. Stay. Awesome. Welcome to the parachuting championships being held inside the biggest wimpy in the world at Piccadilly. Power Plus and get yourself some stay. There's some power. vintage adverts on the Power Plus. Change the wimpy. Hilary Hardman, Slimming Magazine's new Slimmer of the Year, is a Slimsier girl. Now, seven months later, Hilary is a shapely nine-stone winner. Good news for home buyers. Homes Weekly, Nanadu, a dazzling motion picture filled with spectacular sight and sound. It's at the ABC Shaftesbury Avenue and other leading West End cinemas now. <laughs> the Capital Countdown. So real vintage 1980s there with some old commercials for Wimpy. That was uh, the British version of McDonald's back in the 60s and 70s. And even a trailer for the Xanadu film. So that dates it 1980. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this automotive distraction. 
don't worry, we'll be back to the Beatles in the next video, so please subscribe so you don't miss out on that. Meantime, don't forget to visit our website, parlogramauctions.com, and also you can find us on Facebook under Parlogram Auctions. But that's all for this one, so I'll say bye for now, and thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.